like okay. eligible, I'd be happy to. We now have that online stream, Great. so we're going to hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to volunteer. <laughs> I do, I told you. I, yes. I know, yeah. I'm happy to volunteer for Golden Eagle. And Judy was the aware of our now, start time? The foundation or did it down. change? No. <laughs> That's true. Hundreds, mm -hmm. hundreds, you know, hundreds of scholarships that fill it out one time. The staff kind of figures out where you might be. Mm -hmm. That's great. It used to be, you know, filling out 50, 60 applications for each individual scholarship. Now it's one. I know. It's fine. Yeah. And it's, it's nice, you know, sometimes it's just, it's fine. It's yeah. nice to go nice ahead and get started. Yeah. I will call the meeting to order. Let the roll call show that Mrs. Rutkowski is not currently present. The first item of business on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Lamar, would you lead us in the pledge, please? <laughs> I thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item is an executive session pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 and ARS 38-431.03A4. I move that we go into executive session. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, the board is going to recess into executive session. Yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 
No. Yeah, 
I said three million? Wow. <laughs> I said, because I heard that I said, okay. So um, you're going to destroy the property. Yeah. And um, that's what I One year. One year. I can do one drop. Okay. 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 Okay.
Oh, I think it went with You did. Board. It's okay. There were plenty in there. Yeah. It's, it's fine. There's no shortage. <laughs> All right. The board has returned from executive session. Um, we need to connect uh, Dr. Sweeney. Unfortunately, Dr. Sweeney isn't able to be with us in person tonight, so he will be joining us via phone. We're going to get him connected, and then we will move on to informational reports, uh, starting with the superintendent's comments. <laughs> you got this. You got this. You can do it. Hello, Patrick. So uh, while we work on getting a hold of Dr. Sweeney, we're going to move on to governing board reports. So we'll start with you, Ms. Reed. Um, I attended the um, facilities consolidation meeting yesterday. Um, we met at the middle school, and the committee um, is taking information down uh, so that um, we can compile a report to bring back to the board at the end of June. Mr. Starr? Good. Okay. Um, Dr. Um, Bernard. This afternoon, I attended the Fountain Hill to Gives Community Foundation, um, where they awarded the PTO, our Fountain Hills PTO, $5,000. Wow. Nice. Um, they awarded Falcon Fiesta, which is the graduation party, the lock-in um, party. They awarded that group $2,700. Nice. They awarded our Fountain Hill softball team, um, about $1,200 for equipment, and I think those are the three groups, but the groups that are affiliated um, with our school district, Fountain Hills Coalition, also received um, a grant, as well as Junior Achievement. So That's very, it was very nice, and it's a great organization. So very nice. we thank them for their support of our district. Absolutely. Yeah. Mrs. Rakowski? Yes. <laughs> Anything to report? Well, I actually scheduled myself to uh, do a webinar, but I didn't have the chance to do it yet, so but that's, that's what I did do. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I got through all of the uh, budget webinars over spring break, and now um, I'm able to move forward with catching up with some other uh, ASBA webinars because they had uh, one that I believe was about diversity two weeks ago, and then um, today, actually, I think it was, um, they schedule their webinars from like four to five, and when we have these work study sessions at five o'clock, it's really hard to yeah. <laughs> participate in both. Um, but it was all about um, employee employee handbooks for school districts, which I know we organized one last uh, academic year, and um, I will definitely be watching that to see if we can um, glean any tips for uh, improvement as we continue to work on um, defining our practices and procedures as a district for the benefit of all of our staff. Okay. And I know you're trying to take notes and then you can't try to call. <laughs> if you want to leave your phone unlocked, I can keep trying to call. <laughs> Yeah, 
he's not feeling well. So it's entirely possible that um, oh, he's you. resting. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Um, I did text him and tell him to call if I'm Okay. I think we have some of the background on the action items, so we can go ahead and move on. Um, unfortunately, I know I have some questions on our first action item for the approval of McDowell Mountain Elementary Roofing Project that hopefully um, Dr. Sweeney would have been able to ask for us because I don't see that we have John in attendance in the audience. Um, Chris, do you have any information on the roofing project? Very little. Okay. What is your question? Well, so I see from the... Um, the school uh, facilities, facilities board, thank you. I'm like, yeah. I can't think of the acronym. The SFB, uh, that they approved 344,000 something. It was based on an original quote that we received that was at the, the 286 from the roofing uh, company plus like a management fee and a warranty and other stuff. But then the roofing company has come back and said because of changes in material prices, they're increasing their quote by five thousand dollars. So are we just getting the three hundred and forty-four, whatever it is, from SFB? And is our outlay then the five thousand dollars that changed in price since the original quote? Or is the school facilities board updating their thing and, and covering all of it for us? The other piece is the um, quote slash authorization that we got from SFB said it expired on Monday this week. So were they giving us like a grace period on that? <laughs> so it, it has to be, um, according to Patrick, um, it has to be completed by the end of the school year. Like we had to get our quote and, and move forward so right. we can have the work done in the summer. No, I know so. that, but it said that the, I, th I took it to mean, because I saw that it was, the work window was from like June of 2021 to June of 2022, but then their offer to us expired on Monday this week. I think they so must then have. Hopefully they extended that. I and believe Because so. we need to pass it and approve it because of the purchase price. The No district staff can just authorize it on their own. We right. as the board have to approve that, and now it's already passed the date that was on the document. I believe they must have extended that because Patrick actually talked to them on the phone. Okay. I do know that. Okay. Um, and and I would guess that um, same with the five thousand dollars is that once we pay everything, we submit all the invoices to school facilities board, and they pay us back. So. I, I would still like. I, I don't want to vote on it until yeah. we have no, confirmation we get on that. Uh, while I trust your um, judgment, <laughs> yeah. Joe. I just I know because he was talking about it last night. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. We yeah. just talked about the facilities yeah. meeting. So yeah. Right. But that's fine. We'll wait for Patrick. I want to make sure that all our ducks are in a row. Um, so then the other item is approval of the district office staff, which was an addendum for us. Yeah. Was it? It should have been. Or no, so it was seven, pages seven mm -hmm. through eight. For some reason, I downloaded the, the board packet that is only like three pages. That's a revised. That's the revised yeah, revised exactly. One. I stood away from <laughs> no, it like, very much. I need the. It was only one. three pages. Do you want, I have it on. Yes, if you wouldn't mind. Do you want me to give it to you? Sure. Thank you. Much appreciated. What page is it on? 
page seven and eight. So district office staff and director's work agreement contract renewal. So this is the list of district office staff and directors for the 2022-2023 school year. Mm -hmm. And we have um, the personnel in the district office, uh, which constitute executive director of student services, executive assistant, director of facilities, director of finance, HR coordinator, director of IT, and then um, we also have work agreement renewals for uh, other supplemental district office staff like our database support specialists, technology specialists, budget and student services specialists, um, other IT specialists, et cetera. Are there any questions about um, or discussion about authorizing the issuance of contracts to these district office personnel? Well, aren't we aren't we approving that we give we give Dr. Sweeney permission to do that, or is it we're actually yeah. authorizing? No, it we're authorizing okay. administration to issue yeah. contracts. Yes, okay. so the board okay. authorizes administration, administration to issue contracts. Okay. Yes. Any questions or discussion about this list of personnel? We've talked about it already. Yeah. Okay. I will go ahead and move that the board authorize the uh, authorized administration to issue contracts to district office staff and directors for 2022-2023. A second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. And that takes us through the action items that we can cover at this moment. Um, I think let's go ahead and my well my sticky wicket is that technically we're in the business meeting right. oh. and I would table these items but we need to adjourn the business meeting and then open our work study session. <laughs> you do have an um, information discussion item in the business meeting I've reviewed the administ administrator contract and Chris can you speak on that that we're going 11 months on that for our principals? I can't look at this. So we had, moving on to that topic then, um, we had a couple previous discussions in board meetings about um, the different contract lengths for principals, counselors. Hey, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Whoa, we can hear you too. Maybe just move it up, yeah, the microphone up a little bit. There you go. That seems like an easiest solution. It might not work. Okay. Hi, Dr. Sweeney. Maybe not. Can you still hear us? And maybe we do need to just have it over here, um, unfortunately, so that he can hear. Well, that's not. <laughs> no, no, no. That's I know that. Speaker, yes. Right? No, yeah. he'll be able to hear. He'll be able to hear Nadia. Yeah. Oh, the problem is, is, is yeah. Here, you know what I can do. Tell him he's missing his cookies. <laughs> Such problem solvers. Good job. <laughs> and that's on live stream. So does that make up for the last part? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we, we rearranged the furniture enough so that you'll be able to hear us, yes? I hear you fine, yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and we hear you fine as well. Uh, we, we bumped around the agenda a little bit while we were uh, waiting to get a hold of you. Uh, I think we probably came out of executive session quicker than you expected. Uh, we are at the portion of the agenda where we're ready for your superintendent comments. <laughs> okay, um, I'll be uh, relatively brief. Uh, Madam President, members of the Joey Board, and yes, I had the privilege of speaking at the South Hills Chamber of Commerce breakfast last Thursday uh, and shared information about the district, basically the state of the district. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to that group. And as you are all well aware, we get a lot of ongoing continued support from members of our local, local business community. 
Uh, the chamber is sponsoring an event this Saturday uh, called Tunnel Hills Day, and that will be down in the Avenue of Commons, and it's from 10 to 4. We do have a booth reserved down there. Um, I know on very short notice, uh, Chris Hartman, Kevin Wilkinson, and I believe Board Member Judy Rakowski have volunteered. We've got a couple of slots down there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I appreciate uh, people willing, being willing to step up on that on short notice. I also want to say, I believe there were 16 employees today uh, who were part of uh, the first induction committee meeting. And this has been set up to help us identify ways to improve the processes around onboarding new employees. Uh, so that when they start with us, they're better suited to step into their roles uh, with the tools they need and uh, the confidence to do the job well. So this group will meet again as we work to identify those things that we know we can do better at both the district level and the site level uh, to accomplish those goals. And that's all I have for you this evening. Thank you. Uh, we did already go over the governing board reports and then we moved on to action items. We uh, discussed a little bit and then skipped over the roofing project because we had uh, some questions on that. We have already approved the district office staff for 2022-2023, so now we'll head back to the roofing project. Um, I had a couple questions on that around the fact that in the addendum we received, um, I saw that the original roofing bid that had been quoted um, also had a, a supplemental um, page that showed that the bid price was going to increase because of materials price increases since yeah. that original bid. Um, is schools facilities board going to cover that additional um, $5,000 that I know when we first submitted the paperwork to them, it was without that materials price change yeah um i can't say with certainty i believe they will be covering that but um i talked with uh, a, a person from there last week and was under the impression that the full cost was going to be covered um i i'll have to get clarification on that if we do have to cover that additional few thousand dollars i think it's a good investment on our part to do so Yes. Um, and then my other question was, um, okay, here it was. It was the registered architect. So the project manual that was provided, um, the there's an expiration date of 3-21-2022, so this past Monday. Um, I see that's just for the registered architect, uh, I guess, certification that has no bearing on our timeline for this quote correct no again i was told by schools facilities board that this was good through the end of this school year okay does anybody have any additional questions yes mr sar um patrick uh with the price of uh, petroleum products and that being the main element of the roofing uh, project uh, do we see additional increases coming up before we start construction I don't believe so. I think the um, growth that you've seen with the slight modification in pricing is where we're at right now. Um, and I don't think we'll see uh, much, anything, or if anything, beyond that. I do know this project was ready to go, and I believe you're all aware. Um, it had gotten in the pipeline, but it never received board approval. And so I know um, that the materials for the project have actually been purchased and um, are all you know staged and pretty much ready to go. Okay, so we shouldn't see any price increase from a material standpoint unless they have to acquire additional. And we can give board approval tonight, is that the, the plan? Yeah, that's the plan, to give the board approval tonight yeah. so that they can get it uh, in the schedule. As, as uh, Dr. Sweeney was mentioning, um, before uh, the breaks kind of went on, so to speak, because hold on, we have to get the board to approve it. They had intended that they were going to do this project over spring break while, you know, students weren't in the building. Um, so it was ready to go. Um, with our approval tonight, they'll go ahead and, and slot us in for a new date window so that we can get it done um, before the date specified by the school's facilities board in June. That is all correct, yes. 
Any other questions or comments? All right, do we have a motion? For the, uh, for the roofing? Yes. Okay, I'll make one. Okay, I move that the board approve the attached bid to repair the roof at McDowell Mountain Elementary School. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion on the table, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The last item, uh, Superintendent Sweeney, on our agenda for the business meeting portion is the information discussion item of the review of administrator contracts. Yes, um, this uh, item concerns the contracts we will issue to our site administrators. And as you're aware, there were some discussions uh, over the last couple of months uh, about moving to 12 month contracts for site administrators. And after uh, discussing this with them, uh, my recommendation tonight is that uh, we keep contracts at 11 months, identical to this year's, um, but just reflect a two and a half percent increase in salaries. Uh, I know one of the board's concerns uh, is having registration available to prospect the families throughout the summer. And we're working on a couple of different scenarios. I'm confident we will have uh, a resolution to providing centralized registration over the summer at the district office during those four weeks when the schools are closed, which is basically mid June to mid July. Um, so that's the, the main thing I wanted to bring to your attention tonight is our intent is to issue, uh, again, identical contracts to what they had this year which are 11 month contracts and reflecting a two and a half percent increase in salary. Okay. And this was just an information discussion item. There's no uh, action for us on this tonight, but are there any uh, questions or uh, discussion from the board on this item? Okay. We're, we have shakes uh, of the head no. So I think we're all good on this, Dr. Sweeney. Um, and that wraps up the business meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and move that we adjourn the business meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adjourning the business meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we will move on to the work study session. So I'll call that to order. And let the roll call show that all members of the board are currently present as we start our work study session. We do need to approve our current agenda for the work study session. Do we have a motion on that? I move to approve the agenda and the work study session. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda is approved and we will move on to public comments. Uh, Mrs. Rutkowski, will you please read aye. our um, public comment statement? And do you want to just put the phone here? Yeah. Sorry, we can't take any more comment cards after the meeting already began. So we started the meeting at 5 p.m. Really? Yes. Okay. You ready? Yes, go ahead. Call to the public. This is the time for the public to comment. Time limits may be allocated. On, let's see, sorry. Limits may be allocated on public comment at the discretion of the board president for the board to efficiently complete its business. The board reserves the right to prohibit any comments made in a discourteous or threatening manner. Complaints about, a specific, uh, about specific individuals, students, or personnel are discouraged. Uh, personnel issues should be directed to the appropriate staff member or administrator per district policy. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.01 capital H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter responding to any criticism or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. Thank you. All right. Our first public comment is from Cheryl Stiles. You can come up to the podium. Um, we do have a three-minute time limit. 
Um, so I apologize. I'll give you a notice at 30 seconds. I'll say 30 seconds when you have 30 seconds left. I will interject. I don't mean to be rude. This is my postmaster speech. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Cheryl Stiles, and I am a resident here of Fountain Hills. Um, I've been here for over 10 years. We've been here for over 30 years. My family has lived here for 30 years, and we enjoy my beauty, the immense beauty of this town, this state. We want to have several of my neighbors here, and we are very interested in finding out a way that we can support the district. We understand from January meeting, there's some funding challenges and concerns. And we want to uh, lend our support to you in that way before we consider as was uh, mentioned that I saw in the Fountain Hills Times, selling the vacant lands that we have that are so beautiful, where we have natural coyotes and javelinas and the gorgeous foliage that grows there on the lawns. <laughs> and the yes. bobcats. I didn't have that in the backyard. Um, but what we want to come to you at is to say, are there other alternatives that we can consider at this time? perhaps, um, looking through some budget lines, uh, some, some of the existing buildings. What can we do as your neighbors who want to support our school district, who want to support our town, who love our town? What can we do to help, you know, whatever needs to be in the next ballot to perhaps garnish that support in our area so we can get a proper voting to support the school district? And so I wanted to bring that to you spoke for a minute 30 seconds so far <laughs> not bad from toastmasters experience but we do we want to not only not only want to make sure that we keep and protect the lands that we have here that are beautiful but we want to also support the school district so um, that's what i'd like to ask is to take a look at you know instead of selling the vacant three plots that we've got what can we do you know, looking at the existing building consolidation, what kind of funding? How can we help as neighbors to, you know, talk up that activity so we can get the funding that you need and, you know, the residents here can vote on that? Thank you. I'm going to look for my turn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yes. All right, our next public comment is from Brian Brickerman. Good evening, as I mentioned to the last speaker, um, it's a three minute time limit and I will give you a warning at 30 Thank seconds. You. I don't mean to be rude. I'm not the elephant speaker here. <laughs> I live on El Lago and my property basis, the property that you're considering here. I've been here 23 years and when I bought that was deeded by the developer to be either a school or a park. And then I heard that the laws were changed and that was they could sell it, but it was zoned R1. Well, R1 to me meant similar construction to what we have on Alago. And now I'm seeing what's being built down here that some of the people I associated with say they call it the ghetto. So you know what I mean? The new construction because it's so small and bunched up. That's something I don't want to see. And it would devalue our property and the town's property. So you. you Apparently, have the right to sell it. I hate to see it sold in the way that, that I've heard. So, you can clarify that for me what you're planning to do. There's no discussion officially what you're planning to do. I look forward to hearing it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, and our last public comment is from Marsha Fears, I believe it is. Good evening. Good evening. Do I need to Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm also a resident here in Fountain Hills for uh, 29 years. And, and um, we also live on El Lago. We have the school property behind us. And um, I'm here it just really supporting what the other people have just already said. So I don't need to repeat it. But I would like to encourage you all, um, you know, 
to find options that perhaps we don't have to sell the land and I we would also I'd be more than pleased to help support whatever we need to do to help the city raise funds for, for the school district. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Those were all of our public comments. So we'll move on to information and discussion items, starting with FHEA, an update from Mr. Buckley. Good evening. Welcome. I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so good evening. Um, not, not as much as when we have our main confer going on, so we finished that. Um, AEA, we did have some reps that came in and are, uh, are giving our teachers free lunch at all three sites and um, an overview of what was in the meet and confer um, from the teacher standpoints nice. so that it's very clear for our teachers um, what uh, what kind of gains were made, we think, for working conditions and salary as well. Um, I'm talking to our site reps. Um, retention this year will be iffy. Um, I don't know that we're going to have, I don't know that it'll be quite last year, but I think it's going to be similar. Um, maybe a little bit less. We may keep a little bit more than last year, um, but we are looking, I think, at um, some numbers that aren't quite what we were hoping for for retention, since we're a little bit lower than we wanted to be. Uh, we'll know, of course, more when contracts are, uh, when the window closes, so that, that opened up on Tuesday. Um, so teachers still have uh, just over, I guess they opened up on Monday, so we'd have until you know, two weeks from yesterday okay. uh, to finish that up. And so, um, as far as some other things that we're doing, uh, we will also have some representation at the Fountain Hills Day uh, with the district. We'll be there, um, so it's not going to be a separate thing, but we're going to show up with the district administration as well. Um, and then, uh, um, looking forward to setting up uh, the professional development committee that we fought for uh, through meet and confer, so we're excited to see the developments there. Um, and. Awesome. I really, really appreciate the effort to share amongst the staff the changes that were made um, with meet and confer so that, because I think sometimes changes get made at the top level and when they're not communicated in a clear way so that people understand the benefits that they gained and, and maybe things that like, we didn't get this this year, but we're still fighting that for that next year or whatever it is, right? So that they understand how it impacts them and that they, that maybe some of the concerns and issues that they voiced did not go unheard and un unanswered. Right, um, and then uh, I did forget one thing I wanted to mention was, you know, um, we had our, our wonderful neighbors um, in public comments talked about some things that we can do um, for extra funding. Uh, and so FHEA is, uh, you know, we've been talking with AEA and we're looking forward to partnering in a campaign for uh, specifically that uh, district override, the $750,000. Um, we lost that. Had we won that, we would have $750,000 in our budget for next year that we won't have. Um, so that is something that all of our neighbors can help us campaign for. The district tried very hard and lost that election by, I, I think it's like 200 and some votes. Right, yeah. 200 votes. So any help that we can get there, that would be wonderful. Um, we know that when we were negotiating um, salaries, one thing that was brought up is while that is district, um, or while that is um, capital funds, that there are also, so there's DAA, the 1.3 million, and before that comes in for a year, we can shift that from capital to m and um, but our district administration was hesitant to do that while we were losing seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and so one of the main things that I saw on social media um, that Joe you you know I saw you had responded to some information that was out there on social media and just clarifying the record that like you know because a lot of people were like well, we didn't want to support the capital campaign because it doesn't affect our teachers and you kind of did a very good job of explaining exactly how that does but I can tell you as somebody at that like meet and confer negotiation that, that very much did 
affect the money that was there for staff. So that, like, losing that election did harm what our salary schedule looked like and could have looked like. And I do think that that's going to have a retention, that, like, that will have an effect on, the on retention. Because as much as we can work on working conditions and making this place an amazing place to work, if we're not funding our, if we're not paying our teachers competitive wages, you know, or above, you know, like with the competitive with competition right now, like we have to stay up on salaries, so we need the money, mm -hmm. um, and or else we're gonna lose the teachers. So, um, just wanted to clarify some of that, and that we look forward to partnering with the district um, on that, and have already kind of gotten some wheels turning. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Going back to something you said, just for clarification, you said that there's an agreement that. Faculty are going to get their lunches covered. Um, well, no. So we, uh, so what AEA did is just brought in for a day. They just brought oh, free lunch and for, for food. food in. Oh, the okay, presentation, okay. right? Yeah. Just to no, have they brought food in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. No. We appreciate we appreciate all that you've done. To it's so nice to be able to have a teacher's voice represented at each and every one of these meetings and. Um, to Nadia's point, going to the Budget 101 sessions, one of the things that we want to do, and we would love teachers involved, um, is having people understand capital pays for the electricity. If you don't have the money to pay for the electricity, you have to take it out of your other pot of money to pay the electricity. But a lot of people, to your point, don't understand the, R, the way the different pots of money work. So. As always, you know, we want to support teachers. You are, you know, our number one, um, uh, number one people. Number yeah. one <laughs> asset. You're the number, yeah, you're, I mean. You're the front line. You're the front line. <laughs> you are, you know, there for the kids. Yeah. You it, know, we're, we're here for our, the kids. So. Our mandate is really student achievement, and that mm -hmm. doesn't happen without the teachers. Without the teachers. So, um, you know, we want to make this a great place to work, but we also understand with the teacher shortage, throughout the state and the country, it's very easy to be able to jump the ship um, and look for a more competitive salary. So we'll keep doing what we can do, but we can't make, we have a magic wand. We have finite resources and we're gonna continue to try to get that money to get in the hands of teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, uh, we have assessments. We're going to get an overview of the assessment calendar through the rest of the year, followed by an update of how the assessment tools have been used throughout the year already to determine growth and needs. And as we can see, Mr. Alexander is here to present to us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I'm here just to kind of give a, a, a brief overview of kind of where um, we are as far as the, the assessments that we provide our students um, and our teachers utilize to measure where they're at um, at all three schools. And what you'll notice throughout the presentation is there's a lot of cohesiveness. Um, a lot of the same assessments are given, um, and that's by design. We want our kids going from pre-K through 12 with the same assessments, and so there's no curveballs as they transition from one school to the next. Um, another part of the presentation will be um, the also popular state assessments um, that are in our near future. Um, the month of April is state assessment season, and so um, all three schools will be going through that. So I'll, I'll go over the schedule that uh, our site administrators have coordinated for the three sites um, and, uh, and give you a, a little bit of an overview too on those assessments and what's given. And then um, I'll wrap things up with um, a brief um, update on where things are at related to special education um, and then also the um, professional development um, oversight committee. Awesome. So this particular presentation and the slides that you'll see in the information um, in here was a collaboration with site administration, uh, Dr. Sweeney and myself. Um, 
So uh, Mr. Wilkinson at the, uh, at the elementary school in McDowell um, provided this information in regards to the assessments that are, provi that are provided students and administered by um, teachers at McDowell. Um, IXL, which I presented on, Mr. Markle and myself presented on in December, um, an overview of IXL and the, and the, um, and, and the measuring instruments within IXL. Um, star reading was also something that we covered. That's part of our move on when reading um, through the state. So um, these are all um, instruments that we use to assess our students in regards to growth um, or um, the, the latter. Um, beyond textbooks, um, the formative assessments within BT um, are also utilized, and then obviously teacher created assessments are also utilized. So to kind of give you an idea of what a teacher would look at, um, and student name has been blocked out uh, for their uh, protection, um, but this is what a, a printout would look like um, as a teacher would see that to assess where students are at. And these were um, presented to parents at uh, parent-teacher conferences to kind of give them an overview of where their child is at as it relates to the STAR reading benchmark. Um, if you see the bar graph, that kind of gives you a really good indication of where that student is. Currently, they sit in that yellow, that interventions mark, but they're approaching um, the, the on watch, the blue area. Um, and the projection is also an interesting indicator as well, um, where you can see them projected at, at the next time they test. Um, and the STAR reading is um, a, uh, a, a quarterly assessment that we do throughout the, the year. So the last time that this was given um, was January 4th, um, so right upon our return from winter break. Um, and then the other uh, interesting piece that we like to look at too is the, the zone of development where that child sits. Um, and that's their grade level. So right now, this particular child sets between 2.4 and 3.4 grade level. Um, and this child is a third grade student at McDowell. So um, again, not exactly what we want to see, but we are seeing growth and progression in this particular report. Question for you. Um, for the reading in particular, uh, do these scores in any way correlate, or do parents get information on like the reading level that their student sits at? related to either a Lexile level or like a Fontes and Pinnell. I know when my kids were in elementary school, I was always like, what are they at? Because then I would go to the library and find the reading materials exactly. that were at that level and then work on pressing them up to the next level. Absolutely. So the great thing about um, the, the Renaissance program, which is how we administer STAR, um, you can actually select how you want to communicate the data. So you, when you print it out, you can actually have it indicate the, the Lexile score um, so parents can have so yeah, it's a great tool to, for us to be able to utilize. Yeah. I might be jumping ahead. It's okay. So a teacher gets this great report. Um, what are they able to then pull out of it to know the specific skills that that student may need in reading to continue to move along into the um, at or above benchmark? A great question. So this particular report, again, this is just an overview of the, of the overall score. Um, okay. Teachers can actually go even deeper down into the weeds and you can assess students, um, again, the, the Lexile reading levels and so forth. Teachers can also utilize, utilize the STAR system um, similarly to IXL um, to where you have kids in, in, in um, reading groups. Um, of similar ability levels. Um, and again, at McDowell, they have the reading block in the morning um, that they utilize. And so that's what, that's the time where they pull students out and they group them based off of the reading level to work on those, um, those specific skills that those kids need to develop to move to that next level. So moving on to the middle school, um, again, similar assessments that you see at the middle school that you did at McDowell, um, IXL diagnostics, um, and I'll go a little bit more in depth um, as far as when the IXL diagnostics are used and utilized. I won't bore you with a lot of details because I didn't cover that um, back in December. Um, and then also the personal learning plans, which are also provided based off of the IXL diagnostics. Um, common, common formative assessments, which are also in Beyond textbooks, um, that gives all of our teachers those common assessments that we can utilize and, and start having conversations about. Um, you know, measuring students from one class to the other. So all, say, fourth grade teachers could come together and have a conversation and look at standards that may have been achieved at a high level or a low level, um, depending on um, their particular classes. And then teachers can have a conversation saying, oh, well, my students scored really well on this standard, but not so well on this one, but yours did amazing. 
what did you do? What did you maybe do differently? So it gives us, it gives our teachers a lot of tools and insights about how students are performing and what areas we need to focus on as teachers to, to help them improve. Um, and then also within uh, BT, the benchmark assessments and then um, obviously teacher creative assessments that, that would be part of the assessment process. Chris, can I ask one question? Real yeah. Quick? I know we talked about it uh, several months ago now, but the personalized learning plan, um, how is that developed? So IXL generates that personalized learning plan for the students, um, and it's based off of their diagnostic. Um, and so um, as Dr. Barnard asked about the STAR reading, the, the IXL diagnostic will break down by standard um, where students uh, uh, either fall short, meet, or exceed um, where they need to be based off of their current grade level. It'll give them an overall, overall score in math or in English. Um, so for example, if a student is in, say, fifth grade and they score you know, between 500 and 599, that means they're within grade level. That 500 means it's a fifth grade. If it's 600, that means they're in the sixth grade and so on and so forth. So it gives our teachers a, a good indication of where they're at. And again, we can start to differentiate the instruction based off of it. And that's where that personalized learning plan comes into play. Well, to Nadia's discussion, are parents involved in that to, so they can do it uh, on their time as well? They can. I know some of our teachers do, and, and again, if you, I know at the at the district level when I'm looking at the IXL reports, I get to see the percentage of the IXL work that's being done in class and as opposed to outside of class. And I know a lot of our teachers assign some things to happen outside of class, but a majority of it is being done. I'd say 95% of it is being done in class. Um, but IXL reports are certainly something that teachers can utilize to share with parents, say, parent teacher conferences, which we just had recently, um, to kind of show you know, performance levels, specifically math and English, of where their child is and, and currently sits. And, you know, I know a lot of parents start to look at you know, advancement grade level to grade level right now. And so this is, these are important tools for us to be able to share with them. And if we do have a conversation uh, with parents as a teacher, um, do you see uh, a <coughs> collaboration between the two to determine reading, you know, what reading materials are appropriate for that student. Absolutely. Do outside of class with math, are there, is there a book that we can show the student, uh, the worksheets that get them up to where they should be? Absolutely. I think those are, those are discussions that are ongoing. I know in my conversations with building level um, principals, they, they, they have those conversations with their staff about, you know, that open dialogue with communication. Again, it's, it's, it, it takes a village mentality, right, to, to get these kids through it. And uh, I think for, for teachers, it's important to know kind of what's going on at home, what parents are seeing, what behaviors they see, study habits, um, you know, so I think those are healthy conversations to have uh, between our teachers and their parents, for sure. How much time do you get on the computer? Exactly, that too. And so for IXL diagnostic, um, again, it's beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. And IXL is something that the middle school has used for a handful of years. Um, elementary and, and, and high school are just kind of now getting on board. Um, but with IXL, it was a way for us to, to monitor growth and skill development, skill building, specifically in English and in math. Um, and so we just gave the second IXL diagnostic um, when we shortly return back from winter break, and then we'll, we'll do another one probably beginning of May-ish, um, you know, I know high school's going, man, we're going to have to do state standardized testing, and then we're going to have to have finals, <laughs> yeah. and AP exams, and so forth, so we kind of kind of wedge that one in there um, at the high school. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, IXL will create individual learning plans uh, for continued skill work when students uh, log into IXL. They'll, they'll actually get um, what they need to work on as they, as they log in. And, um, specifically at the middle school, I know they use it, and, and this is not just unique to the middle school, but in my conversation with Mr. Markle, his teachers are utilizing it for either bell work at the beginning before classes are starting, um, exit tickets as students are wrapping up a particular class, um, and some students even, uh, he says that some students are even asking to get on IXL when they finish with an assignment that's being done in class because they just enjoy it. They like getting on there and doing that work. So that's, that's, that's awesome to see. Um, and then just as an example for a sixth grade, um, you know, students uh, at the beginning of the year and middle of the year diagnostic, the ELA score, 660 level, math 671. So in that example, a sixth grade student would be at the level that we want them to be at mid-year. They're right in the middle. And then again, beyond textbooks, these are the common formative assessments. Um, these assess students' understanding of current standards being taught. Um, and again, for those of you who don't know, beyond textbooks is, is kind of our roadmap. It, it tells us what to teach 
um, and they're all aligned. It, it gives us a scope and sequence as educators of um, how long to, to um, in essence, spend on a particular unit, um, how many days, lessons, et cetera, um, but not exactly you know, how to teach it. That's up to the teacher to determine. Um, but those common formative assessments really give us um, a, a good indication from teacher to teacher and, and help us measure you know, where our students are at, um, no matter who the teacher is, and, and gives us kind of a, a comparison there. Um, but it's used to direct reteach opportunities, enrichment opportunities for our students um, when we give those um, in, in within the uh, academic strategies course at the middle school. Um, and then benchmark testing, um, it's used at the end of quarters. Um, it's similar to like a final. Um, and information from these assessments and IXL data help drive um, their instruction um, and uh, conversations during their team time and department meetings and um, in and, and, uh, and Mr. Markle's meetings that he has with team leads and, and grade level leads. And again, similar to the other two, the high school uses IXL beyond textbooks, performance matters, um, and also teacher created assessments. Um, Again, to kind of give you another idea of, of what you would see at the high school, um, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year, in just math and English, used to monitor growth, skill building, um, students that are given a, a grade level equivalent. So, uh, for example, a, a ninth grade student that took, say, the math diagnostic and scored a 930, that would tell us that they're at the appropriate grade level um, for, for their um, age. Um, and it gives recommended skills. Um, each domain in math and ELA provides students with recommended skills they need to strengthen um, in order to improve overall score and ability. Um, and teachers use this, the recommended skills for, in, in, in other words, for like bell work, um, you know, um, to fill in gaps here and there um, for um, differentiation. And, and that's, that's one of the things that if I was in the classroom as a, as a teacher, would love to, differentiation is a very challenging thing for teachers to do, um, to provide multiple levels of, less, of, of the same lesson to, to 30 students. That's really challenging to do. IXL kind of takes that guesswork out for the teacher. Um, it provides just, again, another tool for them to utilize. And then as mentioned, uh, beyond textbooks, common form of assessments are used uh, to assess current standards being taught in class, um, engaged students. So this is for reteaching and enrichment, as I mentioned before, with the middle school students. Um, and then benchmark assessments, uh, these are given through Performance Matters. Um, all core subject areas, English, Math, Science, and Social Studies give the benchmarks. Um, there's a test banks, of, test banks of, of questions that teachers can pull from on BT. Um, in, in other words, to kind of create their own customized um, assessment for what they've covered in their particular class. Um, and again, it's all standards based. So, so teachers can literally go into BT and search by standard. Um, and they can really get into the, to the, to the weeds of it to create a, a very sound assessment for our students. Um, and then, you know, what do students still need to learn to be proficient at the next grade level is kind of the, the whole outcome for the common form of assessments. And then moving on to the, the state assessment calendar. Um, so I'll start with the high school and then get to the uh, elementary school to wrap up. Um, I know shortly after today, um, all three schools will be sending out their testing schedules um, as they navigate through this. There's still some kind of minor tweaks here and there, but for the most part, this should be solidified. So um, a change. Um, I feel bad for our 11th grade students because last year they had to take AZM2 as 10th graders, and now they're taking ACT as 11th graders, so they get it back to back years, which AD tries to not have happen, but unfortunately it's, it's hitting our 11th grade students this year to be assessed twice um, in back-to-back -back years. But um, this year we um, have moved to the ACT. Yes, it's the same ACT that qualifies students for colleges and universities. Um, so a lot of states, a lot of people scratch their head like, how is that a state assessment? A lot of states have gone to this, this method um, and utilized the, the ACT as their state standardized testing. Um, and it, it kind of takes I think probably the guesswork um, at the state level of creating these assessments or finding a, um, a proprietor to create these and we purchase those and, and administer them. So um, it's, it's a universal tool that, that kids are familiar with, educators are familiar with. So um, I, I think ultimately it'll be uh, you know, a good thing for us uh, as a state to move to this. But it's a newly adopted state assessment for our 11th grade students. Um, and uh, the, uh, the 11th grade students are all required to take this. So even if there is a 11th grade student that is in our virtual academy, they have to come to school on the testing day to take it in person. The state does not allow virtual testing to take place. Um, I know our administration is working hard with the 40-ish 
uh, high school students to um, get them comfortable to be on campus and have those conversations. And those, those started happening even prior to spring break. So I think they are ready. So April 5th is the date that the ACT will be administered to all 11th grade students. Um, the testing window will start from at 7.30, just like a normal school day, and it will end at 11.45. We will serve lunch um, from, uh, from 11.45 to 12.15. Um, however, because of the length of the ACT and how it has to be administered, it can't be broken up into chunks. Once you start, you have to finish. Um, and you can't do certain sections at different times um, or at different intervals. Um, because of that, we have a large window. So the dilemma was, what do we do with the remaining two hours of that class day? Do we have all six classes for say 15 to 20 minutes, which doesn't really seem like very useful? Um, do you break it up and just say, okay, it's first and second hour for an hour each, then you're leaving out you know, third through six. So the idea was to just give an asynchronous learning day to all students. So teachers will require students to log into their PLP accounts and they will have some type of classwork to do as their attendance for that day, and it will be um, you know, submitted by the end of the day for, for their attendance purposes, and then teachers will monitor that progress for accountability. Yes, I have a question. So since we're administering the ACT, can the kids use that as their AT, ACT score for college? Great question, they absolutely can. So okay. part, of, part of what um, administration at the high school is doing now, there are forms, so students have to create their My, My ACT accounts, and so they'll be getting that paperwork here shortly if they haven't already received that. They'll have to fill those out. And once they do, they'll be able to send those scores out to any university that they're looking to apply to school for. Well, that's one test they don't have to pay for. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Do our CTE yeah. programs at the high school uh, need to take the TSA technical skills assessment? They don't have to. They don't have to. It's something that we've discussed. Moving you forward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have some questions. Sure. Um, are, are they charging us what they charge parents for their kids to take the ACTs? Or, or yeah, is the state funding? Like who's paying for the state? The state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good. Um, <laughs> and then um, are they? Because I know they, the ACT is it just they're just taking math, reading, or are they doing science and writing? Yep. Or just it's writing, reading. Um, it's it's science. It's math. It's all of it. It's the, How? How do they get that in that four hours? I feel like. No, that's when you take the ACT, yeah. that's how long you have to take it. Yeah. No, so, I know, but I, I swear Jake did all of those and he was there till like from seven to like three. No. <laughs> oh, maybe. Huh? He, went, <laughs> he went somewhere after. Right? <laughs> no, they're done by noon. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so here's my question. I mean, I think it's great if a kid, a parent now doesn't have to pay for the ACT, which is very expensive. Um, I mean, with all three sections, with every four sections, it's $135. So that's a nice cost savings for families. Um, but my question is, is are teachers able to get these scores and drill down into them to help students then get the skills that they need to get to, um, you know, I hate collecting data that's not going to be used by teachers to help our students. And the fact that then our kids are going to get free ACT tutoring going into their senior year could be pretty exciting. So how does that work in terms of the information that's provided back to the school on the skill areas in each score in each of those Great skill question. Areas? I was uh, I attended a webinar that uh, Beyond Textbooks put on earlier today, um, and those were a lot of the questions that um, site and district administration had. Um, what's the data going to look like when we do receive it? Um, Again, we have a right to know um, as far as where our students are performing and, and we want to focus on growth areas and you know, celebrate the wins where, where we succeeded. So um, I think it still remains to be seen what exactly it's going to look like um, and how deep down into the weeds it's going to be um, because this is the first time that we've, that we've seen it. We, we were notified that we will see, obviously, overall scores. We will see a breakdown of where they, where they achieved and what marks they hit on the specific sub areas of, of the test. Um, far beyond that, I don't know specifically what it's gonna look like because again, we haven't administered, so I haven't seen one of the reports yet, mm -hmm. so. Um, I mean, I just think it would be an amazing opportunity to, for our school to take those scores and help students get better, you know, from over the summer between junior and senior year to get scholarship, I mean, that's scholarship money 
a lot of scholarships are based on ACT scores. Absolutely. Um, and then, um, I knew my question was going to go out of my head. Um, <laughs> okay, it'll come back to me and I'll ask it. I'll ask Jump it. in whenever. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, what I'm always concerned about is um, test taking strategies. I feel like we've worked so hard on getting our students to understand the content, which obviously is important to assess mastery, proficiency. Um, but I always feel like we just do, not us, in gen just in general, do a lackluster job of teaching testing strategies. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you figure out? And, you know, ACT has great practice, free practice. and. But um, is there an opportunity before our kids take any standardized tests? I'm not just talking about this, but um, to actually, you know, whether it's in academic strategies or whether it's in an English class or whatever it is, to teach our children test taking strategies, like how to eliminate and how to come up with different ways to try to figure out which answer is the best answer. Because I really truly think that kids that are good at test taking strategies tend to score higher on these, regardless of their proficiency level with another student. Because they can eliminate, they understand yeah, right. the, the process of elimination, and yeah. you know, discard certain information, pick out key points of information within a text, that, that sort of thing, absolutely. And I think we, we tend, and, and not, I wouldn't say it's just unique to us here in Fountain Hills, I think right. this, is, this is something that's, that's systemic across this 100%. state and everywhere, mm -hmm. where we focus primarily on the accelerated courses where we teach test taking, test taking strategies like an AP or an honors course or an IB course, um, but we don't really focus maybe as much as we should in general ed courses about those strategies. So those are things that we're constantly reviewing, um, specifically at the high school right now, because we do know how much hinges upon a student's performance on this. You know, our district really big on college and career readiness. You know, this is a test that's aligned with college and career readiness, mm -hmm. so we need to help prepare them. And, there's a lot of tools I think now that we even have at our disposal within like schools PLP. They have pre-ACT prep courses that we can take. Um, you know, the College Board has them as well. So we're looking at those types of things because I know last year when um, I, again a majority of our kids take SAT as opposed to the ECT, but more and more taking ACT because they have stronger skills in math. So that science component factors in and they can score higher. Um, you know, where we were offering PSAT. You know, now we're looking at doing PACT mm -hmm. because we know our students are going to be taking this yeah. as junior. So, you know, just kind of shifting gears a little bit to get them more familiar with the test because I think, that, again, the more times you take it, um, the more the, the, the more likely that you are going to achieve a higher score the next time around. So. Yeah, they can take that PACT mm -hmm. in fall of junior year instead of the PSAT. Exactly. It gives right. them that preview mm -hmm. for then what is both college important and now state important in the spring. Yep. And exactly. what's, what's to our advantage is that there's free tools online. So I would really encourage you and the high school uh, principals and guidance counselor to send, I mean, it's April 5th. You know, there's no reason why everything is, all the, the practice tests are free. There, you can go on, I mean, I can tell, I guess I'm gonna, I know I'm being filmed, but my kids studied for the ACTs on TikTok. I mean, there are lots of two-minute snippets on test-taking strategies, and they actually scored really well. So I would say, you know, letting parents know and letting students know what the resources are out there, because there is that sweet spot where you don't want to scare a child taking a standardized test, but you also need to give them a little bit of boost that it's meaningful. So, you know, to find that spot and to let both students know, but also parents, hey, you know, here's a couple opportunities if you, your child, yes, it's a standardized test for our school district. However, to Jill's point, you can use this for college. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of it. Here's a couple, you know, practice tests. Here's, you can go to the college board. They have free tutoring. Um, you know, I, I think it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't give that information to parents of 11th grade students. Absolutely. I think, I think also, too, I look at the... The opportunity, as you mentioned, for all students now to take this. It's mandatory for all of our juniors to take it, where you might have some students that wouldn't have taken this because of right. the cost associated with it, which there, there are ways that we can sort of navigate that, right? Um, but some students now will maybe receive a, a score that surprises them in a good way. And well, they say, and that's well, just wow, it. you know? Yeah. You know, because a lot of kids maybe only take the SAT, and they're like, well, I already took the SAT. I don't have to take the ACT. But I'll just tell you from both my college kids that are both at Grand Canyon, 
So Grand Canyon awards their merit money based on the highest, GPA, SAT, or ACT. You may do better on the ACT than you did better on, than you do on the SAT. So it's really worth taking them all. And now that this is free, it's a great opportunity for our kids. Now your GPA was free, your ACT is free. <laughs> so go out for that SAT and, and get the better of whatever, you know, that you're going to get your scholarship on. So yeah, I think that's a great opportunity. I mean, I'm not a big advocate of standardized testing, but if the state's going to do something, at least they've done something useful now. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and back to your point about preparing them. Um, I know last year's principal high school, when this information came out that it's PCT, my first call was to PT going, are we aligned? <laughs> you know, is, is algebra, geometry, all those things, are, is it aligned with ACT? And they were yes. like, we're looking into it, you know? And so um, I had our math teachers on it, Ms. Barsima, Ms. Day at the time, were looking into it and making sure that we were good to go. So that was some of the work that they did over the summer to nice. make sure that what we were doing from a BT perspective was aligned with what was going to be on the ACT and we were good. So Excellent. we didn't really, we didn't have anything to worry about. Excellent. Uh, Chris, when do we see the results from the ACT? It's usually not till the, the summer months is when we'll see it. But long yeah. before, we used to get them in November of the, of the following year. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit more you know, quick on the uptick now. So. I think they come in July, but yeah. aren't, aren't the scores like embargoed until they usually September hold them. or something? Yeah, they usually they're hold they're them embargoed then. for a while. Yeah. I know, yeah, we'll usually get them and then we're passing them out shortly after school. Um, and then also, um, and uh, if you don't like state standardized testing, then here's more of it. Um, <laughs> the, the high school will also be administering the ACT Aspire test to our ninth grade students this year, as well as the AZ Science test to, unfortunately, the 11th graders. <laughs> um, they're getting doubly hit this year. Um, so the ACT Aspire is a newly adopted state standardized test for ninth grade students. Um, students will be assessed in the following areas, English, math, reading, science, and writing. Um, the easiest way that I can explain ACT Aspire, it's Aspire for ninth graders. It's going to measure them on everything that they need to know as their ninth graders. So it's ninth grade English, it's ninth grade science, so there's some biology in there, um, there's some physical science, there's some Earth, Earth and space stuff. Um, it's mostly like Algebra 1, a little bit of geometry in there, but not a lot. Um, so it's all appropriate for ninth grade students. Um, and then for the AZ science test, this is nothing new. Um, the, the state has been asking us to administer the AZ science test for a number of years now. Um, students are assessed in the following years, physical science, earth and space, and life science um, on that. So does the state take a view, because if they're doing the ACT as 11th graders, and that includes a science component, does the state take the view that the standards that they want assessed in science in particular are not fully covered by the ACT? Those are great questions that have been asked time and time again in a lot of the uh, webinars that I have attended over the past 18 months. Um, a lot of us um, have been scratching our heads on why the AZ science test did not go away this year, um, and we really haven't been provided an adequate answer in our opinions. Um, it's probably paid for. Yeah, the the, vendor. Paid for I was gonna say the, the, the vendor uh, is saying absolutely not. Yeah, there's an assessment window that we agreed to administer that particular assessment with whatever company created it, and yeah. here we are. So, um, but yes, to your point, there are there are a lot of similarities on what is asked of our students to, to show their skills on. So I guess the ACT is their pretest, maybe, for the AC, AC science test. <laughs> My students took their uh, science test today. Oh, did they? Okay. Um, so testing will look a little different on the 12th. Um, so from 7.30 to 10.30 is the testing window. Um, for all, on all students that are, um, all students will be on kind of what we're calling a late start schedule. So the ninth graders and the 11th graders obviously will be on campus doing their thing, testing. Um, the 10th graders and 12th graders get to sleep in um, <laughs> that particular day. Um, and then they will arrive at 1130 um, that particular day and begin their day. So on the 12th, we will have periods one, two, and three on that particular day. Um, so again, on April 12th, there at the very bottom <coughs> of the slide, you can see the testing window 730 to 1030. We'll have lunch from 1030 to 1130. Um, and then classes will start first, second, and third. Um, and then the following on Thursday, the 14th, we would have done it on the 13th, but we had an early release and we didn't want to oh. 
you know, screw with that schedule. So um, set almost exact same schedule on Thursday, April 14th, except instead of periods one, two, and three, at the end of the day, we'll have four, five, and six. And then for the middle school, um, our middle school students will be actually the first ones to hit the assessment window. Um, they actually take uh, the science test for fifth and eighth graders on the 28th, so next Monday. Um, and so they have their schedule, they're ready to go. Um, so it's an assessment to the fifth and eighth grade students um, at the middle school. Again, as I mentioned previously, physical science, earth and space, and life science. Um, the middle school will be on a normal schedule throughout the day, so they don't have any modifications to their schedule as you saw in previous slides for the high school. Um, and then April 11th through the 14th um, is when they will give the new Arizona Academic Standards Assessment, or the AASA. So this particular test is taking place of AZM2, AZ Merit, however you want to call it. Um, it's pretty much the exact same test except with a different name. Um, and so this will be administered to third through eighth grade students at the middle school, or sorry, third grade through eighth grade. Um, but again, at the middle school, it's fourth through eighth grade. So every student at the middle school will be taking this. Um, similar to um, the state standardized test for the high school, the ACT and the ACT Aspire, the, this exam has to be administered on site. So any students that are remote will have to come to campus to do that. Um, administration at all three campuses are working with those students to create a schedule for them to where they feel comfortable being on campus if they're related to illnesses and being uncomfortable because of the you know COVID that's still lingering and that sort of thing, um, but has diminished considerably. Um, but they, they will have smaller testing um, uh, like cohorts, yeah. um, you know, maybe instead of 15 to a room, they might have six. So just to kind of be able to spread out a little bit more. Um, Do we have the same um, percentage that needs to take the, do we have to hit 95%? 95%, yeah, it's still 95% rate of testing. Um, so the testing, uh, students are assessed in the following years, reading, writing, and math. Um, and testing will be divided over a four day period. So Monday the 14th is the writing section. Um, math is a two-parter, so they'll do part one on Tuesday. Part two, or sorry, part one on Tuesday, part two on Wednesday, and then Thursday will be the reading, and then they'll, that, that's how they'll finish up. So those four days. And then at McDowell, um, they're a little bit more spread out. Um, Ms. Wilkinson wanted to give the third graders a little bit more time to kind of digest um, as, they, as they navigate the testing. Again, uh, it's the same exact test as I went through with the middle school, um, except at McDowell, it's just the third grade students that take it. Um, they have um, another component to their test just for third graders, it's called the oral reading fluency. Mm -hmm. um, and so on Tuesday, April 12th is when they'll take the ORF um, and students basically read passages. Um, they're given time limits and it's it measures their oh, reading yeah. fluency. Yeah, and there's, oh God, um, they do that separately or? They do, okay. yeah, and so and that's why we dedicated just a day solely to that um, because they have to have headsets and okay. that kind of thing for it, yeah. Okay. And our Students with 504s, IEPs, do they get an alternative or are they still required? Students that do qualify for the alternative testing absolutely do. Yeah, and then there's also accommodations that we could have depending on services that students need. Okay, yeah. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So that, we had to submit those requests to the mm -hmm. state months ago, like I think it was like January 7th was the due date. So yeah, we were, we were far ahead of that. Okay. So. Um, and then again, just the breakdown of the, of the testing schedule. Um, so they don't start until Thursday the seventh with the writing section. So um, again, the writing, the state is very clear. Writing has to be done before anything else. Um, and I think the date was April fifteenth. Writing had to be done before April fifteenth, and then everything else could go. So, um, but the AASA has a, a very large window um, for us to test. So Mr. Wilkinson's taking full advantage of that and just kind of spreading it out. Um, ACT was a little bit different. We're, we're hindered upon what the ACT and the college board tells us mm -hmm. when we can test, um, and when they come in agreement with the test. There were two testing windows for the ACT. One was in March before our spring break, and one is after. So we elected, you know, talking to our teachers, we wanted to do it as far back, you know, close to the end of the year as we could so they could cover as much material standard-wise as possible to get kids ready. Um, and then the makeup window will be April 25th to 29th for the Um, and then finally, uh, just an update. Uh, Dr. Sweeney um, asked me to provide you a little bit of update. I know there were some um, you know, questions, concerns that uh, the board had in regards to where things are. 
um, some of the updates and known challenges that we have been focusing on over the last, well, I should say all year, um, but really specifically the last three or four months. Um, staffing issues, uh, K-4 teacher at McDowell, SPED preschool teacher at McDowell, and also a resource teacher um, at the high school. Um, any outstanding IEPs that still needed to be finalized, uh, compliance with 504s, uh, the SST process, uh, that's our student um, referral process, um, those of you that are aware, and then compensatory minutes for speech services. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the four major areas that we were kind of looking at over uh, the course of the year, but specifically the last three or four months. Um, so, where are we? Kind of what we've been doing, action items that we've that we've hit um, to tackle this. Um, <clears throat> our SPED department has been in contact with staffing agencies uh, weekly, multiple times weekly, to, to try to fill our vacancies. As, as you all know, um, we are in a teacher shortage uh, across the state, a severe teacher shortage, um, and it gets even more impactful when you look at special education. Um, and so we have been scouring, you know, staffing agencies across the state um, to try to find people. Um, we've had 15 plus interviews um, over the last, I'd say, I don't know, 10 to 12 weeks. Um, we were really close to having a resource teacher at the high school permanently, and then her current school offered her a job and she elected to stay there. And we've had that happen on multiple occasions uh, for the, the three vacancies that we have across the district spent wise all year, um, where we've had somebody and then they backed out, they didn't want to make a move out of state. Um, they wanted to stay at their current school, they got a better offer, or whatever it may be. So it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge. Um, we've even attempted to fill vacancies with uh, former uh, FHUSD SPED teachers that are currently retired and sitting at home. Um, we actually have two of them splitting duties at the high school as our resource teacher right now, um, and they're helping out tremendously. Um, they've been a really great resource because they know the kids really well. Um, and um, they love retirement, but they also love coming and helping us out um, when we need it. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's been nice having them back. Um, outstanding IEPs uh, will be completely updated by end of day this Friday. Um, there have been some things that um, have, we've been waiting on a couple pieces of paperwork from parents to complete that process. There's, there's a part of that that parents have to complete. Um, in essence, kind of assessments that they do at home that we've been kind of waiting on. So um, those should be updated and ready to go uh, by the end of this week. Um, and then compliance with the 504s. Um, We've been having multiple trainings throughout the year, um, mo most recently on 118, um, right when we got back from winter break with administrative staff. Um, we've uh, had an additional training scheduled uh, for tomorrow, coincidentally, at the middle school with their staff. Um, refresher trainings are provided whenever needed um, by the SPED department um, for site level administrators. Um, and then just consistent, constant communication with building level admin about 504 renewal. So um, our SPED team will look at uh, the 504s that are possibly coming up that need renewal and give the site administrators that lead the 504s um, in those meetings plenty of heads up at least four weeks minimum um, about one about ones that may be coming up so they can get those scheduled and communicate um, with um, the teams um, that would be meeting for those students including their parents. Any questions on any of that? Good. You gave great details of, on everything. I'm really happy to see that our IEPs will be in compliance by Friday. Thank you for working hard Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. And to Absolutely. all the SPED teachers for working on that. Yeah. They are. They're, they're, very, they're working very hard to, to complete those, yeah. Um, and then the SST process, refresher trainings have been provided to all site-level administrators. Um, you know, we've, we've really tried to focus in on this SST process. Um, to one, and for those of you who don't know, SST is a process that we utilize to identify students that are struggling and having challenges. Um, it's a student support system. Um, and so we bring in all of their teachers. So at the high school, for example, you know, a student has six teachers. We bring in all of their teachers, have a discussion what challenges we want to bring the parents in. Um, and for, a lack of, for an easier way to explain it, it's kind of like an academic intervention, if you will. Um, it's, to, it's to kind of ask the student, you know, why are you seeing struggles? And, you know, a student may be excelling in Algebra 1, but bombing in English. What's, what's going on? You know, obviously, student, students have aptitudes in certain subject areas, um, but there may be something that teacher A is doing that teacher B is not aware of that could help teacher B pull that kid out of their funk and get them to perform at a higher level. Um, so that's kind of what SST is about. It could be an attendance issue. It could be a behavioral issue. It could be an academic issue. Um, but again, it just kind of throws all the cards out on the table and have a discussion about that kid and make it student-centered and, and what can we do again kind of that as the mantra says you know it takes a village it's all of us kind of coming together um, to kind of have dialogue about how to help uh, that particular student uh, get better at what they need to do. Chris 
that doesn't mean they're going to end up with an IUD. No, no, absolutely not. No, it, it obviously could get to that point, certainly. Um, but the goal is, I mean, that, that's, that's, IUDs are not the cure all, right? That, that is not the end all be all. So the, the idea is, yes, we want to provide support for students, but th this is kind of the first step in assessing where those kids are at and, and what, what they need. And, and again, it may be something very basic um, that doesn't require an IEP. It could, but not necessarily. Yeah, great point. Especially at the high school level. Certainly. Um, and then compensatory minutes for speech services, um, you know, we, we were looking at, because of the issue that we have with a specific or a former um, speech service provider, um, we looked at the service, um, uh, I should say the, the, um, the, the student roster list that that particular employee was looking at that, that we fell short on compliance minutes for those students uh, for speech services. So um, we've, we've created a, a database. Um, with our new SLPs that we brought in contractually, um, we brought on two additional SLPs and SLPAs to uh, help facilitate this. Um, and so there are about 15 hours per week of compensatory service minutes uh, that need to be made up per student um, that were in that group of, 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 of students. Um, so we're finalizing that schedule right now. There's a couple of students that we're still uh, outstanding that we need to take a look at. Um, some students have actually already started to receive their compensatory minutes, um, but all of them will uh, start no later than Monday the 28th. On their compensatory minutes, so um, the 15 minutes uh, or 15 hours per week um, will actually get us to um, the point where um, by the end of the year we shouldn't have to do anything past that date into the summer months. And those are uh, live on campus. Yeah, yeah, they are live and in person. Yeah, and just for the benefit of those who may not know what an SLP is, speech language pathologist. Thanks. So that's the actual person who's going to come and work with the student and give them the speech services. Exactly. I forget that everyone's in education. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have guests tonight. Yes. <laughs> um, so at this time, I will field any questions or comments that you have. Anything on SPED or the assessments? No, that was very detailed. And, and I really, I just want to emphasize again, I'm really pleased that you've all worked so hard on bringing SPED back into compliance that um, you know, those are our most vulnerable students. And while we, you know, take all students seriously and want them to get the best education, you know, there's just a certain group that need to be advocated for a little more. And, and I'm glad to see that that's finally being taken care of. Yeah. Sure. Great. And then you're also going to give us the overview of the professional development. Yes, thank you. Um, do you, do you, you need a, yeah, water a water Do you need a drink? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too long. Um, so with the professional development committee, um, I actually was talking to Mr. Buckley on the way in. Um, we had our, um, our first meeting today regarding um, the onboarding process. Um, and we really wanted to focus on that to get an idea of you know, current new hires this year, as well as people that we've hired over the last maybe two years, and get an idea from them on what that process was like coming on board into our district. Some of them were coming from bigger districts um, outside of the state or in, in the state. Others were right out of college, and this is their first kind of impression of what this looks like. Um, and so gathering a lot of insight for them, we wanted to get a, an idea of, you know, one, what PD has looked like or what information was shared, wasn't shared, too much, not enough, um, how many days, um, and resounding, and it's shocking to me, um, but the teachers are clamoring for more. They, they want more time with us, and TJ can attest to this. Um, we had this conversation back in January, um, and, and that was something that we planned, and I think looking at, say, like the beginning of the year right now, as it currently stands, our, our process is we have one full day with all new staff members. And the amount of information that we have to share in that amount of time is 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 bad. It's, it's just enough. it's really kind of condensed, and they're drinking through a fire hose. Yeah. And so we're looking at ways already um, to extend that time with them to maybe two full days, and then have on the third day everybody come back and have three full days of PD with everybody. Um, and then and then that's just to start. So um, here in the next week, I will send out emails to try to you know, coerce and, and, and coordinate that committee. Um, and I will I will steer that and I'm excited to get started because I, I like the, the idea of, I, I, you know, I feel like the job's gonna be easy because teachers are already asking for it. It's something that was in meeting conferred that they want. Um, we looked at it as a, as a requirement that we wanted to make sure that we did a better job of. Um, you know, if we have two committees that are kind of dedicated to that, you know, I know onboarding isn't necessarily PD, but there's a PD component to it. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, blending of the two. Uh, and so, um, you know, Kristen and I were in part of that meeting today, and there was a lot of insight, and we thought we were going to have to pull some things out of them, but they were, 
you know, we had, we had a lot of good, but we had a lot of things that we needed to work on and improve, and I think the PD committee is going to have a lot of say in that, too. And, and so I think that the committee part of it, um, I think if any of you have been part of those discussions where you work, it's about ownership. And, and if the people that were pushing the PD on or giving to, if they own the direction that that goes, there, there's going to be more buy-in and mm -hmm. there's going to be a, a lot stronger improvement. So I'm excited to get involved with it. And, and I think, you know, over the next, you know, April and May um, and possibly into June, um, I think we're going to see a lot of headway. And so the goal is by the end of June to have everything buttoned up and it's done. And, and yeah, we might have to call some people in and pay some hourly rates and whatnot, but I think it'd be worthwhile to do that. Um, yeah. just so we can make sure that things are dialed in and, and where we want them to be. Um, and not just for the beginning of the year, but we also want a, a, a cohesive plan for what it looks like throughout the course of the year. You know, really utilize those early release time periods and have some purpose and meaning behind them. Not that they don't now, but really have a plan for the entire school year so there, it takes the guesswork out of it. And so we can do some work, you know, during the summer months with site administrators and say, Hey, let's let's work through this and navigate. You know, what does this look like? You know, when are we going to touch on X, Y, and Z? Maybe it's BT today. Maybe it's schools POP tomorrow, and really have some type of game plan. But also utilizing you know our teachers as, as their resources to get an idea of what they feel they need, so then we can develop it as a group. So, Chris, you know, with turnover and so forth, we're going to have a lot of new onboarding, um, and you know, we come into a new school. You've got the learning management system, aka LMS, and you've got uh, back in my day, diddles and all mm -hmm. these kind of things that are new to a lot of these new people coming in. You can't teach it all in a few days, right? And I agree it's nice to have that big annual thing going on every month or every week, whatever it happens to be. But that first day of school is when you have to use it the mm -hmm. first time. And, and so if, are you going to have the resources to bring those New teachers TJ is like itching to answer your <laughs> question back here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it just, I mean, I've been there, so. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. It's actually one that came up today during, uh, during our meeting. And um, one of our high school teachers that's serving on the committee had a great idea um, about bringing on during new teacher orientation. So if it's a day, two days, whatever it is, asking veteran teachers to come and sit next to them. Mm -hmm. And so let's say, for example, we're talking BT and we're giving our spiel on BT and, you know, we're diving into it. They can actually log into their BT accounts, see it for what they're going to utilize it for, but have that person next to them that has used it before. Right. And, and said, okay, hey, here's a trick. Yes. Or here's what it is. So we've already started having those. Even in the first meeting, we've had those conversations about, you know, because I think we really need to narrow the focus, especially those first beginning days as you've been through, is really narrowing the focus of what do they have to know yes. day one. What do they need to be able to use, talk about, you know, show kids? Like, those are the things that are important. Because some of the feedback we got was like, yeah, we talked about, you know, a specific thing as it related to maybe SPED, but it was about a form that wasn't in two until October 1. <laughs> and, like, you know, as a new teacher, I'm going, hey, I'm right out of college at 22. I'm figuring out my lesson plans. Like, I'm, my head's barely above water. Like, I'm not worried about October 1. I'm worried about... You know, August one. Yeah. So I think that that was really good for us to hear and, and some feedback that we needed to listen to. And um, I think, you know, like I said, I, I almost speak for everybody in the community, but I think it was very purposeful and yeah. meaningful. And I think the PD side will be uh, equally as so. So, right. sorry, can I make two things? Sure. Um, so, one thing that we have, uh, so uh, Dr. Sweeney, when it comes to Title II, has also given $9,000 to each school to allocate for professional development. Um, and so I got to help out with the middle school as far as allocation for that. And like one thing I can say when it comes to having that veteran teacher is like we're out, we're hoping to allocate um, money to have mentor teachers, but then like like to actually pay those mentor teachers to go to that you know orientation and sit down with them and work with them and work with the same people throughout the year. Um, and so we've worked some of that in. Um, and then the other thing, and this is something that we talked about with meet and confer when it comes to professional development, um, is I think that one thing to put kind of in the boards, uh, like on your radar for next year, is we're really going to have to look at calendar changes in order to properly get people taken care of at the beginning of the year and then throughout the year. Um, and we understand that that's a big process. And so we didn't want to undertake that. And then for next year, for me and we're like, well, that might be 
That's a calendar committee. Right. Yeah. That's so a whole there, there's committee. a whole committee. The right. board doesn't actually do that. The, the board only approves what the calendar committee brings to us. So right. you meet and confer whoever your you know your your committee need to get with the calendar committee. Um, and there's some kids who want to be on the calendar. Yeah. 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 How far is our calendar done, Krista? We already did. Um, it's through next school year. So we've already done the 22-23 right. school year. So that's why we weren't so... Not to say that can't change. We've already kind of put that in our, our radar for uh, the 23-24 okay. school year yeah. as far as, like, getting... Because, like, and I, I, I love the meet and confer committee and, like, what they had going before I was around, but, like, it literally states in there that returning teachers only have to be there for half of the district training. Right. And that means that there's two days. There's one day that's a site and one day that's district. And like, as a teacher who's been the new person relatively recently, and now the person leading that stuff, <laughs> like, that's just not enough. Time. Yeah. So yeah, you just need to get with the calendar committee and express those mm -hmm. concerns. Would that um, would that be um, that would not be our school calendar, though. Yeah, that would so be that's our work calendar. Confused. That's the work calendar. Yeah. What, is, so, what, is, what is it that you're asking? That you need more contact days? You need more days so, off? Like, be, I'm, I'm not Right, so, so one of the reasons why we count for the school calendar, when you look at the beginning of the year, that would be, that onboarding process, that beginning of the year PD, that would be a work calendar issue. But then when we're looking at... Uh, like school days and things like that with like early releases. Um, we've had a lot of feedback that our early release time really turns into about a half an hour. It's really hard to do a meaningful PD when you have a half an hour after they've been teaching all day. And so like those are the sorts of things. So that school calendar piece is what we would have to address. And it's hard to address the working calendar part without yeah. then what will be follow-up. Yeah. yeah, and that's going to require a survey because when you start messing with the half days, like, I'll just give you an example. Like, they took away fall break one year. Yeah, right? So <laughs> I, I was here during that time, right. and, and it, it yeah, the Wednesday before things get in, right. Tuesday, like, yeah. So yeah. there's certain days, and all of our decisions should be done be, you know based on education but we also have to remember we're dealing with people and so you're dealing with people who work people who have families that want to make plans and that's why like now the calendar is done 22 to 23 if you go and change that i guarantee you somebody's already made their vacation plans for fall break right. they will kill you <laughs> <laughs> people always say you know we don't want to go you know they're like why does school start so early well, school starts so early because nobody wants to go to school after Memorial Day. Yeah. And everybody wants to have a fall break, and then they want two weeks at Christmas, and then they want a week in the spring. And somewhere, as a board and the calendar committee, we have to fit in 180 days of school. <laughs> so, you know, and they're like, well, that's great. But we still want our fall break, and we want this. So it's like, okay, but we're here to make your kids go to school. So that's where, you know, the, the little half-day Wednesdays, came into play is that one, we weren't getting enough minutes at the high school. So that was the biggest reason why the Wednesday became, that's where it came from. Because when we actually had like a half a day on a Friday, well, first of all, half the kids don't show up. But second, it wasn't giving us enough minutes at the high school. And the high school requires, I'm pretty sure the high school requires more minutes. It's actually less than Okay, so then the middle school. Somebody needed more but minutes. It was the high school. Dr. Sweeney and I had this conversation this right. week, and it was all about the, the if we, because we talked about that actually at the principal's meeting this week, where the the time allotted for professional development on those early release Wednesdays, could we do it just a universal noon release? And that way you got plenty, you got a two hour block mm -hmm. every Wednesday to work on it. And Dr. Sweeney brought up exactly what it you brought up. Give the, up the, the it doesn't give up instructional minutes piece extra, required right. by the state. Um, we're already just barely skimming by with our current schedule at the high school. The other schools were fine. We're right. well over minutes. We're good. Um, it would just be the high school that would be in trouble in that instructional time piece. So you've got to figure that out. Right. Is that you know it, it's making all of those puzzle pieces fit that you're you're not interrupting. You know you're not sending kids home too early that now they're home without supervision because their parents are working. Boys and girls club may not accept all those kids or they just don't have the option to go. 
you know, are we getting the attendance if you if you call a half day on a Friday? Like then our parents are like, oh, we'll just take a three day weekend, which is why we don't go to school on Wednesday before Thanksgiving because people were like, oh, there's no reason to go to school. You're not going to do anything. So we didn't get our attendance on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. There's all these factors that play into that. And buses, buses. The buses are also a big thing. Like if you do like a very early release, like there, it's the domino effect. Right. Yeah. We're not opposed to any of that. No, but, but you guys have to figure that out. Bring it back to us. I, I've given you the whole dissertation now. Good so. <laughs> yep. job, Joe. Thanks. And I will make sure TJ is on the calendar committee. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and I will be happy to look at whatever calendar you bring. Chris, going back to the onboarding for new school teachers, uh, do they get uh, an existing school to sequence, or do they get a blank sheet of paper, and two days later they got to start teaching? There's, there's a lot that they're given, um, you know, instructional materials, um, you name it. So I, I think that that's, again, the things that we have to work with them on now, at least that's the, part, the portion of the committee that um, we feel is the most important is getting an idea of them of what is the most important things that you need to start day one with kids. To, you know, I don't care, and TJ, you can probably assess to this when you're, I don't care if you're a first year teacher, a 15 year veteran, you always get butterflies. It's the first day of school, everybody gets butterflies. I don't care if you're a kindergarten kid or if you're a 30 year teacher, like everybody gets butterflies. So whatever we can do to kind of help, you know, squash those butterflies and that, ang that anxious feeling that our new teachers are gonna feel, the, the better, so. We don't that, give them two days of Harry Wong, then that's good. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I would say, I know this sort of sounds silly, but, um, you know, for the, teachers just to be allowed access to the building to set up their classrooms, you know, to if they have to choose between making their classroom cool and studying scope and sequence, there, there's nobody's going to win in that situation. So making sure that they have access very ahead of time so they can, comfortable yeah, so that they can get their classroom set up so they can feel comfortable in their space yes. and then be able to really focus on the curriculum all the material and, and so, that. Yeah, I know even in our meeting today, you know, we, we had kind of extremes talking about, you know, from previous districts, what have you seen from the onboarding process as a new hire? Mm -hmm. And we had one committee member state that it was two weeks That's what we get. for them. It was five days straight for all new hires. And then you had the weekend to kind of exhale, digest, and then everybody was back the following week. And then you had two weeks with everybody and that might spread, be spread out like district, on-site, district, on-site, so on and so forth, time in your classroom, et cetera. And then, boom, that third week, you're, you're with students. So, you know, is that too much time? You know, who knows? But I think that's what the purpose of the onboarding committee is, is to yeah. figure that out. You know, what is, what is right for us, you know? And I am a big believer in release time for new teachers to go and sit in a classroom of the most amazing teachers. I think that is invaluable to allow that, that, show, that time so yeah. that they can, you know, just sit and watch someone. Um, you know, TJ that is. Yeah, TJ was. <laughs> uh, to your point, I feel like that for Title II, we allocated uh, days for each teacher to take, and we will put a sub in your room, and you can go and They're getting watch, a bite. Master teacher. watch a master teacher <laughs> and come in. So I just wanted to let you know Thank that we, we have no, that. That's, that's amazing because, I mean, that's where you really can learn so much by being able to see someone who is an expert. Yeah. And, and setting up that mentor day, like you said, mm -hmm. to me, yeah. is really important because it, you can't always go to your principal or to right. anybody else, and you're, you're stuck. You know, the, an IEP was put down, you have no idea what it is, so right. you've got this other teacher that you've set for a couple of days, but... <laughs> That you have like a rapport with and yeah. some trust. That, that um, is, that's really that's helpful. Huge. And I yeah. hope that we're compensating that other teacher. That they, they're, yeah. they're getting a stipend. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, the mentorship piece is, is really we've excellent had that because. For in decades, but you know, I, I'm seeing because of our tournament now, we've got yeah. so many new teachers coming in, both coming in in August and those that have come in throughout the course of this year that all need, I'm sure they would all say, well, I need this, this, and this in terms of getting really ready for this next year. Yeah. And making sure that they have their computers ahead of time, they have access, like 
Yeah, the PowerSchool login, that you seems to be a is. big issue. I can't tell you how many teachers I hear at the beginning of school, they're like, I didn't have access to PowerSchool for two weeks. Well, that's an issue. Yeah, <laughs> because now good. that's where all of our registration papers are. All the, you know, the grades, their, their school roster, everything. So that, yeah, that, you guys in IT need to make sure. We had conversations about that today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the school, yeah. like, seems to rule everything. Activity. <laughs> it does, anywhere, you have to have and some sort of know. school management system. <laughs> Ours is power school. Right. We use it at Eva, too. We have power a couple different ones. We don't have access to power school, which I think most teachers wouldn't have up to another element of it. And if you're right, if you don't have it the first day, how do you take attendance? Right. Well, and, I mean, grades. you know, you hit exactly, and all of a sudden you're, like, two weeks behind in entering grades, and, you know, parents already start, I can't even see anything. And, you know, <laughs> I, I feel bad for them. I do. Yes. So. Well, this is lovely. I'm glad to hear that um, we're making strides in professional development overall in terms of having an organized plan because that's one of the things we as a board, whenever we adopt anything new or make changes, we're like, well, let's make sure we get professional development. But then if it's not planned, if there's not a slot for it to go right. on the teacher's schedule, it doesn't really matter if we get allocate the funds to do it if there isn't time for it to happen. And then things just don't get utilized properly and basically it, it's a waste of money. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. thanks, well, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> All right, that was our last information discussion item. Uh, future action, uh, if you have an item that you would like to see on a future board agenda, you can reach out to Krista. Dates of upcoming meetings, we have our uh, next regularly scheduled business meeting on Wednesday, April 13th at 6.30 p.m. here in the Learning Center. And then uh, on Wednesday, April 27th, we have another work study session at 5 p.m. And with that, I move that we adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned.